Well, howdy, everybody. It's Heath Robinson with Topaz Labs, back again with the one and only John Barclay to present Crafting Your Images with Topaz Studio. You know what? I'm not going to stick with that. It was it was worth it. <laughs> I did not know we were doing a Western version <laughs> of this today. I, I better change yeah. my hat. <laughs> I'm up and going great, thanks. Welcome back for all those who have come to previous uh, webinars that I've uh, hosted. Thank you for coming back again and, and welcome to anybody who's new to, to the webinars. Thanks for, for choosing to come along today. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, if you have been paying attention to emails from the folks at Topaz, they've released the new AI Gigapixel and I'm kind of blown away by that. So. A little bit hard to demonstrate, but I think I've put together some examples that um, will help you get an understanding of what's going on there. <clears throat> and then we're going to speak about uh, the workflow. That's what I like to do in general in my webinars is go through how I use the products from, from Topaz in my regular workflow. But first, a big shout out and an apology to my buddy Scott Oberly. You know, last time I was just joking and Scott's feelings got hurt. So Scott, um, now, now he's going to be laughing, I'm sure he is. And my friend Linda Cook, who's um, had a fall recently, I hope she's doing well and tuning in. And then Bill Edwards had a couple of questions. This time I did something uh, different. Um, I asked folks on my social media what they might like me to speak about. And so masking came up and a few other things. So I've based today, some of today's webinar around some of those questions. So first thing, this image that you see on the screen right now is one that received an awful lot of attention. And uh, it was a lot of fun to create this image back in the spring at Longwood Gardens close by. So I thought we'd kick off with something really fun. So here is, you'll see down here that I'm in Lightroom. This is just a TIFF file. I'm going to go ahead and just open this in edit in Topaz Studio. Now I already have Studio open, uh, but it won't matter. It'll go ahead and open it and bring it right on in. So this is an edited. So the first thing we're going to kind of cover here is that Studio can be used all on its own and you don't need Lightroom. You don't need Photoshop but there's many users out there who use Lightroom and Photoshop. And so all the work on this particular flower image was done in Lightroom. And so the first idea here to, to cover is that there's nothing wrong with doing that. And then from there saying, I wanna to use tools in Topaz. So, so let's just, for those that are new, and again, the, the audience is large. And so I need to, we need to understand uh, the basics and so sorry for those who already know how to use it but a quick tour on the left side if you click on these it's for instance if I come down here to impression it's going to give me uh, presets if you will for impression and how I might use those the top one though is going to be my impression workflow and if I click that well, let's go here you'll see over on the right side it's going to apply that preset and I mean, in the middle of the screen, apply the preset on the right side, it's gonna show you all the uh, adjustments that were made to create that. If I go down to the bottom right, I can hit the little return arrow here and reset things to, to where I want them to be. And then later we'll talk about the fact that you can search through all these presets, you can adjust these the viewing of these presets in, in many, many different ways. But for this, I don't want to use a preset right now. I just want to go over and dive in and have some fun right away this time. So here again, slow for those new users. If you go out and get Topaz Studio, it's free. It doesn't cost anything to try it. And anything from this gray line above it, those come with Topaz Studio absolutely free of charge. Anything below here is a la carte, if you will, or you can buy the whole bundle as um, Heath alluded to before. And to do that, you would just go to Shop Pro Adjustments down here at the bottom. And when you do that, it'll bring you out to your page on the Topaz website where you can pick and choose the different tools here that you may want to purchase, or you can purchase the whole uh, set, if you will, at one time. <clears throat> but there's a number of tools we can use here. Certainly, impression comes to mind when we see flowers. 
But what I thought we would do is show you another tool that really works well, especially for this image. So it's the smudge tool. So when we choose an adjustment from that list here, it puts in a layer on the right side. And if you're familiar with Photoshop, that's really what we have as a layer. And this layer has lots of capability that we'll explore throughout this webinar. But for now, for those, I would recommend for those who are new, to, to go ahead and open up the preset. This is different than the presets over here, although essentially the same. And then you can hover over these and it's gonna show you what the standard, uh, the standard presets were that someone back at Topaz came up with. And they're really quite lovely for this photograph. So soft skies is pretty in your face. I love this, the look of soft water. Okay, so the next thing we should understand is that's, that's just somebody at Topaz who said this is how uh, this effect can look. It doesn't mean you can't then go in here and push it more and you're essentially getting like one of those other presets were there. So I can change the strength, the extent, and I have these controls right through to the sharpness of it to affect what that look will look like or how that will, will look. And then, and this is one I think lots of folks forget about. So I, as usual, I'm gonna overcook these images in, in when I'm doing these because I want you to actually see the effect. They might not be the way I would normally do it. Usually the disclaimer I have for those who are new is we're not trying to create perfect images in a webinar. We're trying to teach concepts uh, so that you could take these ideas and then create your own masterpieces. Okay, so we can adjust any one of these. Again, any one of these is going to have its own panel that we can adjust. And then most importantly, at least for me with flower photography, this opacity slider. So if I bring this opacity slider, I'm right here, all the way to the left, we're back to the base image. If I bring it over to 50 or 55 or whatever, I've, I've included roughly 50% of the under, or the background image, I should say, and 50% of the effect of smudge in this case. Or if I go all the way over to the right, it's 100% of the smudge effect is being um, seen here. So this allows you to feather in the look with the original image if that's what you want to do. Okay, kind of cool, right? That's So let's kind of start with that. Um, and if you wanted to, you could just throw it away. And now you could go to something like blur and experiment with blur. And the same thing, it's going to have a drop down list and it's gonna add these blurs that you might be able to use and do like a soft skin or you could do diffusion. So there's two choices, there's Gaussian and diffusion type blurs. And these do different things to give you a dreamy look. And just one other thing here to kind of cover the basics and also have some fun at the same time. Let's say this is the look that you liked, but you didn't like necessarily all of that happening on the, the central part of this image. You wanted that to be sharp. Every layer that we choose again from this list, if I go here to where next to the word blur, there's a plus sign, that's a mask. And now this mask has a number of different ways that we can affect what's happening within this layer. So I can use a simple brush, I can use a spot tool, a graduated filter, and we'll cover most every one of these today. In this case, let's just make it easy. I'm gonna click on a brush tool. I'm gonna make sure that I am painting with black. And how do I do that? Well, this slider gives me anywhere from white to black, or I can just click the white or black because I have a white mask. So white reveals, black conceals. So I wanna paint with black. And then in this case, I don't wanna com completely block out all of the look because it'll look, it'll look weird, honestly. So I'm gonna bring this down somewhere in the middle and maybe even up to 70% closer to white. So now effectively I'm painting with gray. Now here's a little tip. Right now, you, a lot of you are used to using the bracket keys to make your brush bigger or smaller. In order to do that, you gotta click on radius at least once 
Now I can use my bracket key to make it bigger or smaller. If you're finding that you're not able to make it bigger or smaller with your bracket keys next to the letter P, it's because you haven't clicked on radius yet. The radius is the size of the brush. The softness is, is how close together the, the, uh, the green and the red are, and that's basically the feathered area. So anything from the red inside is going to receive that um, masking and anything from the red to the green is going to be a feathered area and you definitely want the feathered area and depending on what you're doing you'll make that bigger or smaller. Edge Aware says it's going to try to grab the edges of whatever it is you're trying to paint. So let's just paint here in this area with this brush and now what we've done is we've brought back some of that sharpness or the underlying original image to show through, yet we're still leaving all of this behind it, beautiful and soft. Okay, let's go back here and move along because we do have a lot to cover. This is the image that came uh, on uh, the announcement, I think, for the webinar. So let's do the same thing. So how, if I'm in Lightroom, how do I get my image into studio? Right click, edit in. Oftentimes it's gonna be up here. If it's not, it's gonna be in your list here. Either one will work. Just to stop real quickly here, this allows you to open it as a JPEG, as a TIFF, what color space and all those things. Those are my standards, so I'm just gonna leave it like that. And now this is gonna automatically open that file in the studio interface. Okay, so what's next? What other things do we have? What other goodies for flowers? Well. To me, one of the, my favorite anytime I think about flowers is impression. So impression now is built right in to uh, the studio interface. It used to be a separate standalone <clears throat> program, but no longer. So let's go over here for a second to the left side. And instead of just clicking that, I'm gonna, just for a second, I'm gonna zero this out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Over here, I can go to impression and I can click on this. And again, here are, all, but there's a zillion of them, right? So it's hard to go through all of these and look at what's available. Keep in mind, you'll have even more if you click on public. So in other words, right now you're looking at just the uh, presets from Topaz, but if I click public, it's going to show anybody who's made a preset and added it as well. I'm going to just do Topaz. So now because I clicked on that, notice the, the word impression is automatically up here in the search box. But let's say I only wanted to look at oil. I'm just gonna hit the word oil and add that. Now what it's going to do, it's going to give me presets for um, anything that has impression and oil in it. Okay, so you can, you, normally what happens when you're using this is over time you're going to get certain ones that you like better than others. So if I click an X on these, it goes back to nothing. So now you're looking at all the presets, but now what I can do is I can do something like this. So if I could type it, it'd be even better. I like these presets. Okay, so now I've just typed and searched for just this particular preset or word, whatever you want value you want to put in there. And now I have far fewer that I have to thumb through to see how I feel about them. <clears throat> and now I can start looking through these and deciding once again, are there, are there any in here that appeal to me? And this one does, I think it's a little softer. So now that's how we use the left side. Let's go over here to the right side. Uh -oh, did I, yeah. I don't know about you folks with Max, but I've been losing my mouse for a second now and again. On the right side, we have a whole bunch of things. We have that opacity slider where we can dial back this effect. And that's how I tend to use this. To me, this looks like a computer generated this. Whereas I think if you come down here, it's much softer. Let me do a before. Oh, let me do it this way before, after. A little more gentle, it almost looks somewhat realistic, 
uh, and maybe create it in camera. So that's the first thing to remember that you can do. And then you have blend modes. And as you hover over those, it will show you different things that are happening with blend modes. We don't have time to really explore that today, so let's stay here. These are the different types of brush strokes or brushes you can use. And trust me, each one of these is going to make a different look happen. I better dial this all the way up so you can actually see what's happening. But these are going to create very different painterly looks depending on which of these that you choose. Okay. But that's really what I wanted to show was presets on this particular image, how you can search through those presets to find certain things and not be overwhelmed with the abundance of presets. Okay, how about uh, you know, a raw workflow with Topaz Studio? Can I do that? Do I really need you know, Photoshop or, or Lightroom? No, they're great tools and if that's what you use, I use them, that's my, my main workflow. Um, so I tend to do my raw processing there. However, raw processing can happen very nicely and it's getting better and better, I must admit, even uh, for me, you know, lifelong user in, the, in photo. And to me, Lightroom and Photoshop, it's become a habit is part of what the problem is. So, gosh, every phone in the world is going off today. Um, so let's look at this. So often overlooked here in the bottom left, are some tools that people are forgetting about. So the bottom left is where we have an overall mask for the entire image. We have some lens correction. If we need lens correction, you have a healing tool for spot healing and so forth. Then we have a crop tool. Over on the right, again, anytime we invoke a tool, you're gonna have some ability here. So you can keep it in its original format so that now when I pull this to make, um, a crop that I like a little better, it's going to retain the aspect ratio, or you can make it, you know, one-to-one -one or, or a uh, panorama or whatever you'd like to do. On this one, that's exactly what I'm going to do, is I'm going to leave, I'm going ahead and crop it in the original format. Once I do that, I simply over here on the right side hit done, and now I've cropped it. If I had dust spots, or something like that, which I don't, I'd hit the healing tool. And here we go, let's pretend these clouds need, need this. I go like this and it will go through, <clears throat> excuse me, and work on those, there we go. So let's leave that as it be for the moment. Didn't do a great job because I used a really huge brush on that and I shouldn't have done that, but we'll just leave that here. Again, we're not making perfect images. We're simply trying to uh, you know, teach what the, the techniques here are to use. Okay. So, what do we do? How do we edit a raw file? Well, my suggestion is you come up here and the very first thing you do is use the basic adjustment panel. And we can change the exposure. And on this one, I want to make it much more dramatic. So I want to make it actually a little darker. <clears throat> I'm not going to use the clarity here. I actually want to make my shadows, I'm going to leave those about there. Uh, and then I'm going to bring some of those highlights down. And then I'm going to push my black level quite black, blacker than I normally would, because that's what I want to create a little more drama on this. And on the white, I'm going to look. When I pull this white slider over, I'm really not looking at the photograph right away. I'm looking at my histogram, because if I push this a much further, notice I'm blowing out something. And in this case, it's the red channel. And you can see it quite heavily right up here. I'm not a big fan of what that's doing. So I want to be careful. And rather than, I think I can take a little of that, but not a lot, because I can balance that a little bit by bringing my highlights down. <clears throat> okay. Next, I might want to do some adjustments where I'm using some masking here. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here and I'm going to get a tone curve. And again, this is one of the free tools. And it's just like a cone, tone curve that you might think about uh, being in Photoshop, right? And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to brighten up sort of this midsection a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and grab in the middle somewhere. And next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a mat. I'm sorry, I'm go to the mask and open on the X. Now this time we're gonna get a graduated filter. Okay, so how does this work? What it does is, um, and by the way, 
uh, this will drive you crazy. If you go to grab like you can on one in a, an Adobe product over here on the right side of any of these, you're going to flip it upside down. You have to grab with inside these boxes. Okay, that's important to know. So grab inside the red box if you want to pull this closer together. And if you want to rotate it, grab in that red box to rotate it. Okay, <clears throat> so otherwise, watch. You see, it just flipped it upside down until I went back and grabbed this. So the way the grab works is anything below the green line is going to receive the adjustment. Anything above the red line is not going to receive the adjustment. Anything in between is the feather, essentially, of that adjustment that you're making. Now, I want that sky to remain reasonably dark, but I want to work on some of that foreground here, that mid-tone, bring out some of those highlights that are happening, especially along these grasses. So by using this, I'm holding back, if you will, that adjustment from the sky, and I'm allowing that adjustment to happen here. Now, let's, let's stop and go back because there's one thing I wanted to show you. Notice in the mask that you can see the rider and the horse here. That's because of this edge aware. And once again, Topaz has a phenomenal edge aware capability. And what that's doing is this, is this area between the green and the red, it is doing its best job to determine what you want to be affected and not be affected. And you can adjust that even more by pulling this edge aware left and right. You notice some of the rider went away, even more of the rider is in the horse are present. So it's, it's doing a good job of saying, hey, wait a minute, don't or do, if you will, adjust those particular elements in the scene. Let's leave it at that for the moment. I'm going to do another one. So I'm going to go in and get another tone curve. It doesn't matter how many layers you create here, because in the foreground, I don't like the detail that's here. So once again, these are somewhat darker tones. I'm going to go ahead and pull down those darker tones. I don't care what's happening in the entire image. I want some little bit of tonality to be left there. Once again, I go up to the X. That's going to bring up a mask. And once again, I'm going to get that <clears throat> graduated filter. Now I'm going to rotate it here, bring it down because I definitely want those grasses to be shining through. Grab on the middle one and pull it down. And now let's see what we have. I'll click anywhere on this on tone. So the other thing that people might be asking about is anytime you click on the word on one of these uh, layers, it'll open up the, the tools that are in that. If you want to close that up, just hit curves. Or if I want to go from one of these layers to another, I can just click on the words, basic adjustment in this case, and I can go back. Okay, so let's hit original before. And once again, my mouse lost its connection. It'll have to be fixed right away. Here we go. And there's there's what we've done so far. Okay, let's let's close this up. What else can we do to enhance this photograph? Well, one of my favorite tools for, for all time is precision contrast or clarity. So you have the clarity tool within Photoshop, both in Lightroom and in, in Photoshop. It's a very good tool, but it's one button. But the difference here is I have four choices here, micro, low, medium, and high. It allows me to have much greater control over what we call you know, local contrast enhancement here. So I've created my own preset called John Start, and that simply puts them in this position here. Again, I can do more of this if I want to, or less of this if I want to, and I love what that's doing to these grasses here. So on any layer, should you want to see what's happening, there's an eyeball. So I'm up here where it says precision contrast. So what do these other things do? It says disabled adjustments. So that eyeball will turn off just on this layer only, that precision contrast adjustment. And then I hit it again, and now I can see exactly what I've done. And done that do a nice job of enhancing. Look at I love what it's doing to this uh, stripes of light here. And then around the, the, the back lighting, rim lighting, if you will, the tail, and along the ridge here, it's doing a nice job. Okay, so on and on and on, we can continue building this image. 
I think we'll stop there and move along because time just gets away from us. But hopefully you've got an idea now that very quickly you can and easily, just like any other piece of software and maybe arguably easier, depending on the type of tools you like, you can go from that to that. And that's working on a raw file. That is a raw file. You notice it's RAF. I'm a Fuji photographer and it's a raw file. Okay, let's go back here for a minute and let's have a dialogue about AI Gigapixel. So AI Gigapixel is the first of its kind. It's an amazing piece of software. I'm just absolutely blown away and I'm hoping I can, can introduce you to it. First and foremost, to make sure we understand, I'm gonna bring in this screen. It is, a piece of software that requires a lot of horsepower in a computer, and I want people to be very clear about that. So if you go out to the Topaz website and you go to batch processing, you'll find AI Gigapixel. I'm gonna click on it for you. Okay, we can learn all we need to learn about it, and I would encourage you to learn about it because it's an amazing piece of software. And the more you understand what's going on, for instance, you know, how much horsepower it takes, it'll help you understand why you need what you need. So how do you learn what you need? Come all the way down to the bottom of the page where it says try it for free and go to system requirements. System requirements will now bring up a page to show you exactly, like I'm a, a Mac user and I have an AMD card and I went sure to check through here and my card is not listed here, so I'm just fine. <clears throat> but you're gonna wanna look at the other uh, operating system requirements here, and there's quite a few. And then down here, it's telling you that if you have a file this big and you wanna make it 400 to 600% bigger, it's 2.4 trillion calculations that are happening. I mean, there, there's a lot of math going on in the background to, to give you the results that this piece of software is gonna give you. So let me move this over to the side again. And let's do this. So I. What I have is three different examples here to kind of give you a, a taste. So the first one is my granddaughter, Abby. And what I've done is I've created, notice this is a small JPEG. That's what we have. And what we'll do here is let's go down and get AI Gigapixel. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, oh gosh, you know what, hang on. I'm gonna have to pull this off of the screen just for a second, hang with me. And I'm gonna drag little Abigail into the screen. And here's what happens. When I dragged Abigail into the screen, it says, okay, here's the image that you want to uh, work on. And it's a very simple interface. You can scale by percentage, you can do it by size, and in size you can do length and width, or height and width rather, and you can put in the pixel size that you want it to be. If you hit, if you choose rather the enhance image, it's on a low quality image, it's gonna do its best to overcome. Um, it's gonna add a little bit of, uh, I'll be able to think here, you know, denoise or noise reduction. I choose not to do that at this point. I'm gonna use those tools later. You can have the output be whatever you want it to be. I'm gonna just do JPEG at this moment. I would encourage you to match the input. It is faster processing. And normally you're gonna to wanna to match whatever you're putting in for the output to be. Don't need to worry about these convert raw files. My preference right now is to work a raw file to the best of its ability and then enlarge that file should I want to. Now, Bill Edwards wrote to me and said, you know, what about sharpening? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, someone else asked about a workflow for, I know is Rich, asked about when to use it. Uh, as, as far as the printing workflow, Rich asked about that. And the answer is it should be your last thing. So you should be doing all of the work that you wanna do. And then if you have an order for, a friend of mine just got an order for a 70 inch wide print last night, I encouraged him to get this product and take a look at this. And that would be, so he'd do all the work, get everything fine tuned and then say, let's, let's enlarge this to the size I need it to be, save it to the file and so forth. So. This one's gonna go pretty fast. Notice up here what it says now. I'm, I've gone ahead and made this quite large to 6,000 by 3,000 up from 800 or 500 by 800. And something like this, a JPEG file, is gonna go reasonably quickly. Uh, trust me, if you do a raw file and then just keep that raw file in its native resolution and then try to just simply double that, go 200%, 
uh, it's going to take a long time, hours potentially, depending on the horsepower that you have. Okay, I'm going to move the screen out of the way and I'll show you the results that I got. Okay, so what I want to do here is I'm going to hit the G key because I want you, oops, let's get back here. I want you to be able to see on the side. Let me go one at a time here. So over here on the right side, in the I'm in Lightroom again, you can see that the dimensions of this image are 8, 5, 5, 533 by 800. I'm going to toggle over one image. Now we've enlarged it to 2132 by 3200. And then one more time, I've enlarged it to 4800 by 3198. Now notice what happened. Some of this noise, this was shot at high ISO. It actually cleaned that up for me on a small JPEG. Let's go one step further. I'm going to go ahead and right click on these and I'm going to open these in Photoshop. I want you to see just kind of what's going on here. Okay, so here's the first one. That's that's a hundred percent size, right? Here is this one, and let me make sure to get this to be. There's a hundred percent sized. So we started with this. Now let's just show you what's going on here. Here's my size panel. Full resolution. This is going to make a two by three inch print at 240 pixels per inch or DPI, dots per inch on the printer. PPI is on the pixels per inch, right, on the, on the monitor here, okay? So this is pixels per inch, resolution 240. So let's take a look now. This is, same image is going to make a 13 by 20 print. Arguably, pretty darn good, okay? If you don't like the softening it did, fear not. It's not always going to do that. It, it, the smaller the file is, the more difficult time it's going to have. So let's move over to this. This is a cell phone image. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to open both of these up in Photoshop. Image number one is just the raw cell phone image. Now let's once again see if we can't take a look. This is where my mind started to be blown. Okay, so here we are, and here's 100%. Okay, there we are at 100%. We have 240 resolution. We can create a pretty nice size. A lot of people are kind of surprised when they see this, a 10 by 13. All right, let's go over here now. What I did is I enlarged this, and I now have something that can create from an this is, I'm an iPhone shooter, a 40 by 54 print. Let me just show you what it looks like. There's no softening or smoothing at all. I mean, maybe ever so little. But what AI Gigapixel is doing is it's using the artificial intelligence technology to do the best enlargement possible. And then it actually is trying to resharpen this image for you as well. But this is pretty incredible. I, you know, I'm going to have to go on this one and make it 200%. And then in 200%, you know, you're seeing a little bit of funniness. But here, let's leave it right here. Let's leave that right there. And you, you determine. You look here in this area. That's the one that's been enlarged. And there, I, arguably, the enlarged one looks better to my eye. It's a little sharper but I don't see any degradation in that image whatsoever. And now from your cell phone, 40 by 54 inch print. This is gonna revolutionize things, folks. It changes the whole world. Just think about now what you can do, all your cell phone images that you can create. Think about the crops that you can do. Think about the fact that you don't need to go out and get a new camera that's got 50 megapixels, seriously. Okay, the last one. Okay, so here, what do I have here? I have an image in Tuscany that we that we worked on in the last webinar. I'm gonna go ahead and open these. What What is this image? Well, this is a, what I would say is a raw native resolution file right out of my camera. So this is a Fujifilm 24 megapixel sensor, or is it 21? I guess it's 21 megapixel sensor. See, I just don't care about all that stuff. It's not what is, what's really important. Uh, okay, took a little longer. We got to get the other one to load here. There we go. All right. So all I did was make it twice the size. So here, whoops. Let's go here. What do we have? 
Okay, so the raw file out of my camera allows me to print something that's 16 by 25 before I have to do some interpolation to make it bigger if I wanna make a bigger print, right? So you can do that in Photoshop. There's, there's other pieces of software, but they're not doing what AI Gigapixel does and using the artificial intelligence technology. So now let's look. I went in and I put in parameters to make a 30 by 40 print. And so now I have, I'm sorry, a 60 by 40 print. 60 by 40 print now out of AI Gigapixel. And I'm here to tell you, I have looked throughout this image everywhere and tried to find something that looks different and I just can't see it. Uh, it's, it's spectacular and this has tons of detail in it. And there's the two different ones. <clears throat> so AI Gigapixel, crazy good. If you have need, to increase the resolution of your files to print them bigger, or if you wanna take mobile phone images and print them bigger, or if you wanna crop deeply into images that you have, and all I mean by that is you just wanna go and do this little piece of this image, you can do that and then up res that or make it bigger again for an acceptable quality print. So highly, highly, highly recommend. I'm just blown away uh, with the software. So let me look at my notes now and let's move on and make sure I've covered the question. So in the printing workflow, <clears throat> I think it's important that you uh, wait till the end of that workflow to, to work on these images and it, it, with AI Gigapixel. And again, please go and check to make sure you have the horsepower to run it because it does take, take some time. Okay, time, 39, we're doing okay. So let's go here. Oh, let's go back to Bill's, Bill Edwards' question. He, he said, or asked rather, about sharpening. So, and he's using a workflow coming out of Lightroom. I would highly recommend that you go ahead and use the sharpening that's in Lightroom. Why? Because the sharpening that's in the, well, here, let's go back to make it just easier here. So if I'm in Lightroom and I hit the develop, let's go to this image that we're gonna work on, and we go down to detail, the sharpening that's going on here, as far as I understand it, it is what we call capture sharpening. So that's overcoming the limitations of the sensor or the, the, the anti-aliasing filter and so forth that's going on. So I think it's perfectly acceptable to add that here if you want to, and I would. And then when you come into studio, that's where you might be doing more output type of sharpening and in using uh, tools like precision contrast and so forth that that can give apparent sharpness if you will so let's come here and i just want to because the question was asked a number of times i want to uh, just cement some ideas here <clears throat> with this photograph and then add more masking knowledge because masks are so stinking powerful and the more you understand the way they work i think the better off you'll be there's a little dust spot right up here so just by way of review i can hit the healing tool i can come here and i can make my brush size bigger or smaller once again once i click on it i can make it bigger or smaller i'm going to click on that dust spot that's going to go ahead and take care of that i hit done I come down here and I hit the crop tool because I was standing precariously on the top of a, uh, uh, a little mound of dirt. And so I couldn't get any plus, by the way, and this is really important, a little PSA here. I'm out in farmer's fields. I am not in the field. I'm on the edge. I'm standing over here just further back on a piece of dirt. You never, ever, please be respectful as a photographer and do not go into their fields. That's where they make their money. Matter of fact, out in the Palouse where this was photographed, people are doing this all the time and the farmers are getting really angry, rightly so. So please be a respectful photographer. It's driving me crazy and it's gonna ruin it for all of us. First thing I do there as I crop it, get rid of that bottom, which I had envisioned doing. I'm gonna take a second for that adjustment to settle in. Good time to get a drink. <clears throat> okay, so Let's just do quick adjustment here, basic adjustments here. I can change exposure a little bit, set a little bit of a black point, a little bit of a white point. By the way, notice when you use exposure in the basic panel, it's gonna do its best to never blow that out. Notice 
over here, the, the right side of this histogram is white, but I keep pushing this and pushing this and it doesn't blow it out, which is really great. That's on purpose. Okay, so a couple of quick adjustments and we've just gone from the original to here. I'm gonna add a little bit of saturation to that to bring those colors to where I think they ought to be. Okay, masking. It's always that little plus sign up here. How about color? What's a, why would I use a color mask? Well, let's see how well color works here. If I click on the color mask, it gives me a dropper symbol here. Now I can click in the yellow. And look what it's done. It's gone ahead and it's masked in black. So black conceals, white reveals. So if I just wanted to work on the, um, wanted that adjustment to only be uh, uh, applied, I could do that, and in this case, obviously it's removing it from there because it's putting black. Up here in the mask, again, where it says the word mask, you have an eyeball to turn it on and off so you can see what the net effect is. The next one is an invert your mask. And so I can flip that mask over and now I can make that white down in the bottom area versus black. So in this case, now it is applying that. So that's where you would use the color. And now if I wanted to add blue to this mask, if I just click on brush for a second and now back to color, I should be able to hit blue and it does, which is a good thing because now it's leaving more of the white down in the bottom, which is what I want to be affected, let's say, right? Because that's the yellow is the target area I was trying to target the mask with. So that's when and how we might use um, the color. Let's, let's do this. And now if we go over here on the mask, let's finish with what are the tools we have here. If I go here, I can copy the mask. Let's hold on that off on that for a second and just reset the mask. What I can do here is I can go to brush again. And let's say I just wanted to brush here and again, remember, as long as I'm not going into the area above this yellow, I can um, create a mask that looks like this. So now I'm saying, okay, good. Let's use this basic adjustment only on the sky, but please don't put it here. Now let's say that we want to create another layer and we want to use that same mask and I don't want to take the time that it took me to paint this mask, especially if you've created a mask that's a detailed mask. Go up to the word mask click on this and let's copy that mask. Now let's put this adjustment away. Let's go to adjustments and now let's go to precision contrast. Let's go ahead and just accept something that's you know really dramatic here. I don't wanna be that dramatic. Let's be dramatic. Now I can go, here I am, here's this layer. I'm gonna hit the plus sign. Now I've revealed the mask and I'm gonna to go to the same hamburger menu and I'm gonna say paste the mask. And look what it did. I was able to now take the mask I've already created, really again, especially useful for when you've got a detailed mask, and now I can apply that mask just in the bottom of the image and do that over and over and over again, depending on what, I, what I'm doing. So hopefully that answers another question that I had before I started. Let me look at my list and make sure we're covering everything here. What kind of time we have for it? Uh, five minutes, it's always never enough time. Again, folks, I would never make this photograph look like this. We're just trying to teach you how the tools work. It looks terrible. Let's do a fun one here. I'm gonna skip ahead. So I'm gonna go as quickly as I can here. I'm gonna do a couple of basic adjustments. By the way, this is, uh, my workshops tend to sell out the day or definitely the week uh, that I announce them. Uh, strangely enough, we have, a uh, room in this particular workshop. This is the Hideout Ranch out in Wyoming in the wintertime, which is a blast. I mean, yes, it's cold, but it's honestly, I'm from New England. I'd rather be in Wyoming in five degrees than in New England in 30 degrees, because I think it is much better, uh, much more tolerable, because it's a dry cold, as everybody says, right? <laughs> so, okay, so we're doing some quick basic adjustments here. I would crop this more, I would crop the horses into here actually. Let me bring this back just a little bit. Let me bring highlights down. I'm gonna bring that black level out, bring this over just a touch and add some, I'll add clarity here. I normally wouldn't, I would normally do this in precision contrast. 
another tool, I'm not totally thrilled with this. Again, I, I'm with the time, I wanna get in and show you what I'm thinking about here. Okay, focal blur is one I've never spoken about in a webinar before. It would be really cool if we made this look a little bit tilt shifty on this particular image. So let's go to focal blur. How does that work? Well, the default is a circular blur tool. But over here on the right side where focal blur is, we can also do tilt shift. And then tilt shift is really fun. So watch this. I can, if I go to the position slider here, I can move where that is. So I'm gonna bring that down into this area and then I can make the size of it a little bigger to include just the horses. And then maybe rotate that down just a little bit more again. And now I've created this really cool tilt shift effect very easily and simply. And the rotation, you can, you'll know what all these do. These are pretty intuitive and I can dial that blur back a little bit if I want to and come in something like that. And now you're drawing all the attention to the line of the horses rather than um, being distracted by some of that background. Okay, so that's focal blur. Oftentimes, you know, people talk about opening up shadows and I've done that here quite a bit. I'm gonna bring this back down again because this tends to make things look a little flat. So I'm gonna bring that shadow slider back down, but some of these darker horses are, are pretty dark and I wish I could bring out some of the tonality in them. And it's not really working well with this particular tool. So let me give you a little trick here that I've been using that I think works pretty well. I'm gonna to go to my adjustments panel and I'm gonna to go to precision contrast. And guess what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna help you understand how these work a little more deeply. So remember, here's my preset. It's, it really tends to be John's start and I tend to do this. Look already, some of the details come out. A lot of times people wanna push these sliders over to the right because that's what starts to look good and feel good. But once you start to understand what's going on with these sliders, especially the high and the medium, watch what happens when I go to the left with these. Look what's happening to the detail in the horse. Okay, I'm gonna bring these, I'm gonna overdo it a little bit now. This whole thing does not look right. Again, I'm doing this because it's made the snow look too black. But I want you to see what's happening here. Let's do a before, and I know there's a little bit of a lag, so I'm gonna pause here. There's before. Oh, actually, you know what I wanna show you? I wanna do it here. I wanna do it in precision contrast. So here's before, here's after. See what it's doing? It's bringing out the detail in those shadows. Now, how would I use it? I would use it a little more effectively than that. These are pushed up way too much because, again, we're trying to show you this in a webinar screen. That might be more of what I would do. Let's take a look at that before, after. It's a little more subtle, and I think this could come over just a little more. <clears throat> and it's gonna help you bring out some of those uh, shadow details. Last one, we're going to work real quickly here. Same thing we're going to do. Well, let's go here. This is also from the Hideout Ranch. And that's at the end of, if anybody's interested, it's the end of January. It's an all-inclusive, when you go to my website under special events, it's listed there. It's an all-inclusive, it is five-star everything. The food is ridiculously off the hook. The accommodations, everybody gets their own half of a cabin and it's like a log cabin. It's unbelievably great and cool. Uh, so let's get this to look right as quickly as we can. This one doesn't take much. I'll use the clarity here again. I wouldn't normally do that. I would do that inside of um, the precision contrast. What I wanted to show here was one other tool that comes from free vignette. And the vignette is a simple, easy way to draw your attention of the, view, of the viewer of your image to a specific area. Down here on the bottom right, there's a little crosshairs. If I click on that, that gives me a crosshair, and now I can put that vignette where I want to. So I'm gonna click right in the middle of the horse because I want it to be there. It's too dark of a vignette, so I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna bring the strength down all the way so that I can then visually see. It's an easier way to see that and just make it a slight vignette. To me, a vignette, you don't want the viewer to actually know it's a vignette, typically. There are certain artistic choices where that makes sense. In this case, I would choose not to. And then 
from there, just to remind you, there's a party, there's a playground, there's happiness up the wazoo going on in the texture layer. First thing I would do here is I would change my blend mode in this case to multiply, bring the opacity up a little bit, and now you can have all of your own um, uh, textures, or you can buy textures. I'm a huge flypaper fan. I'm also a Kathleen Clemens fan. Kathleen's a friend, and she is an extraordinarily talented artist with a camera, and uh, her flower photography is ridiculously good. It's uh, it's jaw-droppingly good, and she's created her own sets of, of textures that I highly recommend. So, did I hear Heath begging me to stop? But if I just get through this last one, so I'm going to go into here and just come down. What did I want to do? Flypaper painterly. That's going to bring up only the, the ones that I want to look at. Then I can add a texture layer onto this. I can make that texture layer stronger or lighter. If you're worried about, if you're saying, oh man, I want to learn more about texture. If you go back in the archives of webinars, I have two webinars specifically dedicated to just texture effects. You'll be able to learn more about that. One last, two quick last little things. One commonly misunderstood is this enhance at the bottom. Remember, right now I'm looking at the texture, all of the tools within the texture layer. If I go down to enhance, it gives me the ability for any of these adjustments to be used on just that layer. So right now, if I pick enhance and do basic adjustment, now these are only affecting the texture layer, not the background layer, which is really, really cool. So know that about the enhance button. You can do that and use any one of these adjustment layers and further enhance that particular layer rather than when we do it this way, when we do it here and we get rid of this and we say, let me put in another basic adjustment, now it's gonna affect the entire image, texture and all, everything. Everything below this layer is going to be affected. And that's not what I wanted to do. And the very last thing is I go on this texture layer and I say, I don't want that much texture on the horse. I open up a mask with the plus sign, I hit the spot, I come over here, I start making this, so that it covers the horse. But of course, I don't want to remove 100% of that because it looks silly. So I'm going to reduce the opacity or the mass transparency with this slider and make sure that I'm removing just some of that texture adjustment on the horse, leaving the feathering capability. And now it's time to take a breath and take your questions. <laughs> I, we really need more time in these things. But anyways, I've gone over by a couple of minutes here. Hopefully you found some of those tips helpful. Uh, if you guys want to follow John, you can always check out his website. Is it still Barclay Photo or is it John Barclay Photography? No, uh, Barclay Photo works. Barclayphoto.com will get you there. You can also follow him on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash John Barclay Photo. Uh, Instagram at John Barclay Photo and Twitter at JH Barclay. Uh, I know there were a lot of questions we weren't able to get to. You guys can reach out to John through his website or you can always contact us at webinars at topazlabs.com. And you can sign up for upcoming webinars at topazlabs.com forward slash webinars. Everybody, thank you so much for sticking around for us. I know we went a little bit over, but uh, we're going to have to see if we can do like a two-hour one. Do we? Yeah, I don't know. We'll put them to sleep, I think. <laughs> but uh, thanks again for everybody stopping in. And go out and have some fun and create some images.